this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Corsair IQ 5000T RGB. This is a mid-tower case, and this is a build guide to talk to you about the various highlights of this case, show you the features of it, show you the build process and all different steps that I went through, and talk about the highlights and lowlights as you go through, and the interesting points that you might find useful if you're considering purchasing or if you're already have the case and you want to build in it. I have done this in two different configurations, one that you can see here with three intake fans and three exhaust on the NZXT Kraken Z73, and then 10 fans set up with Corsair's H150i Elite Capelix LCD 360mm CPU cooler. I'm going to pause for a minute for some peel. And the reason I did this is I wanted to demonstrate the different setup processes for this case because it's an interesting case which is essentially a smart version of Corsair's 5000D series. I did a video previously, a very in-depth look at the 5000D airflow. And the 5000T is more expensive and has a number of our highlights to it that I'm going to talk to you about as I go through this video and the process but if you want to see a much shorter video and you're already aware of the 5000 series i've done a features video which is a lot more compact but in this one i'm going to be showing you all the different things about the case what's included inside and what you can do with it it's an interesting design because it's able to hold up to an eatx motherboard potentially two 360 mil radiators and a mass of fans it also has a number of highlights that include RGB lighting strips along the side and top and bottom. And you'll also see that it comes included with Corsair's LL120 fans as well. So you have some RGB lighting strips and RGB fans included as standard. You also see that you have this cable hiding tray at the back and the ability to obviously mount fans and radiators back there if you so choose there's also a vertical mounting bracket for your gpu although i did some testing with the 5000d airflow and found that you probably shouldn't use that in an air cooled setup you're only really using that if you're going for liquid cooling because it puts your gpu too close to the glass and results in very high temperatures on the gpu that then throttle performance so it's not something you'd want to do as standard but it is possible to do the other highlights of this case are a number of different things. Obviously it has removable panels. The front one is just held in place with a few clips and some magnets and it has a very fine thin mesh on it that obviously will work well over time to block out dust and dirt and keep things running cool and ensure good cooling capabilities. And that was one of the things that I found with this case is that it cools really well in both layouts that I set up and I'll show you later on. Stick with me right to the end of the video because I'll do benchmark tests on both those setups to show you the difference in terms of performance. So whether you're considering just a few fans or absolutely loads, you'll be able to see the various different options and the impact that it has on it. But you'll see there's some really nice accents to this and a lot of well thought out elements to it. Obviously the inclusion of the RGB lighting strips that you've seen a taste of and Corsair's LL120s is pretty appealing. Those are very nice fans as standard. You do only get three of them, obviously set to intake, so you will need to purchase extra for addition onto your radiator, for example, and perhaps at the rear of the case for exhaust. But for the purposes of this video, I'm swapping them out for Corsair's ML120 RGB Elites. And the reason for that is simply because they have a potentially better airflow, thanks to the vortex design of the fin on the back, and they are sort of a mix of, of course, there's RGB fans and those Vortex airflow fans that Corsair had on the 5000D airflow and other variants of that case. Now, there are some other interesting bits to this case design, one of which is this removable top that you'll see here comes away. That itself has a mesh dust cover on it. And underneath, there's also another one which is held on with magnets. You'll also see that you have the RGB strips on the top here and you can see those quite clearly. Obviously you can mount a 360 mil radiator on top or just a multitude of fans. One thing of note though is you do have to be careful when picking the case up because the look and design of it kind of implies that you have some grab handles on there and you could potentially pick the case up and move it around. If you do that you will find that the top will come away and the case won't come with it and you could end up dropping your case and damaging it. So just be really careful if you do purchase it that you don't use that to pick it up with which is quite an easy mistake to make. You'll also notice there are multiple front panel connections 
for USB and USB-C and audio connections, and I'll go into those a bit later on. One thing of note is that there are two front panel USB connections that need to be connected to your motherboard, so you need to make sure you either have a splitter for that, which is an option, or a motherboard that can support it if you want to use all those front panel USB connections. There's quite a lot, and I'll go into a bit more depth on that later on. As you can see, there's also some problems, probably my fault, in terms of this dust cover because if you don't put it back in the right place there's some clips on the underside of that top tray which press against it and are a bit problematic it's a bit tough to get on and off especially if you've got that dust cover in the wrong place so you do need to maneuver it around this is likely down to user error but i do also feel like it's a part of the design that's slightly flawed and the fact that it just doesn't sit in there in an obvious way you have to sort of manipulate it around to make sure it's not going to get pushed into the holes or damaged when you put the top back on. Obviously, whether you're using that is going to be down to personal preference as well. If you're using the top for exhaust, which you likely are, you might not want to use this additional dust cover because it may restrict the exhaust fans from blowing air out. I personally feel like having dust cover on the top is still beneficial because dust naturally falls down, so if your PC is not on all the time, you will find dust settling on top of a PC and potentially ingressing that way. So I do like the addition of it. And there are multiple covers there, obviously protecting the thing and making it look clean and running well over time. Now this is the white version of the case, obviously, and the better looking of the two. I am a big fan of white peripherals though, and it is a really nice looking setup. You'll see at the bottom is where the power supply unit mounts, and then at the rear you have some more things of interest. So you open that up and you'll see immediately that you have a fan tray on the side there, and also there's another dust cover on the door as well. You also have the Commander Core XT included in there, more on that in a minute, and mounting points for several SSDs, as well as two hard disk drives in a bay at the bottom, which I'll show you in a second. The Commander Core XT is a variant of the Commander Core that was included with the Corsair H150 Elite Capilux all-in-one coolers. This is now included with a case and it is an expensive bit of kit but it does include everything including RGB from the ID mounting on the case, temperature sensors, additional RGB control box on the left hand side here which plugs into the Commander Core that then controls the RGB lighting strips on the front. Those both need SATA power, both the Commander Core and that little control box, but I'll show you the process for that. Obviously the LL120s are plugged in for both fan and RGB lighting power to this Commander Core as standard. So if you're keeping them in the case, you don't need to take them out. And it's really nice setup there. They also have some extension leads that lead to the front, so the cable management is quite easy. So essentially the cables are split into two lengths and it makes life a little easier and the fact that it's already mounted pre-installed makes everything really straightforward if you're sticking with that build let's just say you're buying some more ll120s to go in the case for exhaust purposes or to be used with a radiator then it's perfect setup you'll also see the commander core has usb connection for the motherboard but it also has a male usb connection so you can theoretically connect other usb peripherals to it and then you have that flat sata power connector and as i said temperature sensors which are already plugged into the commander core and then you can attach to things like your gpu so you can get a more accurate gauge of the temps within your case if you so wish you'll find all the front panel connections are all stuffed at the bottom as per usual and you'll see here what i was talking about you do have two of those chunky USB front panel connection so that may be problematic depending on what motherboard you have. You also have front panel HD audio and the USB-C connectors as well and I'll show you where those plug in a bit later on. And then the front panel power connections as well, power switch, power LED and your reset switch and I'll show you again where those plug in on your motherboard, it's usually on the bottom right hand side and you will need to refer to the manual for that. And you also find there is a slightly a different cover as well which can be used at the front and I'll demonstrate why and when you would use that a bit later on as well. So you have a variety of options in terms of the mounting and the setup of things. Now at the bottom of the case in the hard disk drive tray you'll find a little cardboard box. That cardboard box contains a number of different and important things that you will be using throughout the build process and it also is housed within this disk drive caddy which can be used for SSDs 
and traditional 3.5 inch hard disk drives. At the rear you'll find three of these mounting brackets for SSDs as well, so for your 2.5 inch SSDs and I'll show you the installation process for that in a minute. But obviously you can mount three there and potentially two in the hard disk drive bay as well if you so choose. Another highlight to this tray is that it can be removed so you can loosen those thumb screws up and then just pull it out. So if you're not going to use it you can take it out completely but it also has a number of hooks on it in the system and underneath and you'll see that if you look at the bottom of the case it's possible to move it forward so you can move it forward towards the front of the case which means that you not only have more room for the power supply unit and the cables on the power supply unit but also you're potentially moving the tray closer to the front which means depending on your setup you might have more air being blown over your hard drives which would probably be beneficial so that's worth considering the caddy for the hard drives is really simple obviously you have three mounting points along the side of your drive you just line them up with the plastic clips you have to fight with the plastic housing to basically pull it out and push the little clips into place there's no need for any screws or anything like that this housing is designed to just hold the drive in place for you and then you slip it back into the bay obviously you do need to make sure that you are pointing the SATA power and data connections towards the right place so we're pointing them towards the back of the case so we can connect them up with the necessary cables to the motherboard and to the power supply unit but again once that's done you can just slip it back into the tray now you are fairly limited in the position for the hard disk drives you only have two potential mounting points here which is a shame if you compare it with Corsair 7000D there was a lot more mounting for that but most people will probably be going for SSDs or NVMe drives anyway so it's not an issue now in the accessories box you'll find a number of velcro ties that will be very useful later on when you're trying to tidy things up there's also some plastic cable ties that you can use to tighten things up a bit more permanently but these velcro ties are very useful in my mind for neatening cables up while you're in the build process before you turn on your pc because you can make sure things are neat but also that everything's plugged in correctly because what you don't want to do is use those plastic cable ties and then find your cables are in the wrong place you plug something in wrong or something's just not working you also get a number of other screws and these are used for different things you will find reference in the manual to where they're installed but essentially you have uh, different ones for ssd mounting you've got standoffs that you can see here motherboard screws power supply unit connections and all sorts of other screws as well there's also fan screws included in the box so you can obviously screw in extra fans that you may purchase and add to the machine which is obviously going to be a necessity depending on the setup and how you're going to do it and then you have your motherboard screws and there are a number of washers included and other bits too so I'm just going to show you the process for installing an SSD now so obviously you remove that tray with its thumb screw and here we have a Samsung 860 Pro SSD that I've had knocking about for a while and you can just mount that in the right position obviously being taking care not to block your ports because obviously you don't want to put those up towards the thumb screw because then they'll get in the way and just flip the whole thing over and then use the small screws to install in each of those four corners to hold it in place obviously this then ensures that your drive is stable and ready to be reinstalled and it also still gives you good access to be able to plug in the necessary cables for this now obviously if you're using three drives at the rear here you're going to need three SATA power connections and the data connections to your motherboard as well so the cabling is going to be quite intense by the end of it and you'll see what I mean when we get closer to the end of this video because there's a lot of cables going on back here and not as much room as I'd like and that's one of my comments about the case but you will find that there are a number of different mounting points hooks and loops that make things a lot easier one of the things that's really good about this case is both the front and back panels are removable there's a screw on the top which holds the, the hooks in and then you just have to unscrew that and you can remove those I personally put those screws back in so that they could then easily find them when I need them to so they don't get lost but it's really easy to take those off that makes the build process a lot easier as well and obviously ensures that you don't damage the tempered glass when you're doing it 
At the rear of the case, you'll also find that where the Commander Core XT is sitting, there's another thumb screw and a few clips which hold this in place here. And you can take that off. And then this gives you access to the back of the motherboard and to mount brackets for CPU coolers and things. But you'll also notice there's multiple holes there. So you can install SSDs there. So you, should you so choose. So if you remove the Commander Core and put it somewhere else, you can put SSDs on the back of that bracket. The fan tray is installed and held in with a number of different screws and the, this is where things become a bit fiddly because you really need to remove the velcro ties uh, where the cables are held in place and fight your way underneath to get access to those screws. I found that you can just sort of push them out of the way and use a screwdriver to get the screws out from under there. Well, the easiest way to do it is to move all the cables out so that means you then end up with quite a bit of a mess. But there are three screws on the right hand side another three on the left hand side. Now you don't necessarily need to do this, but I think it's important to show the entire build process to be able to talk about the problems that I had so that you don't have the same issues. Obviously when installing the 360mm rad on the side, then you will need to take that off. Or if you're installing fans here, then you will need to as well so you can mount them easily. And this process will then show you all the other things that you get access to. So you'll see, for example, there's that bracket at the front which is what I showed you there's a spare of earlier on with this different shape that you can also take out. And there's also the cable hiding cover here. And again, that's held in place by multiple different positions. It's held in place with some thumb screws on the front of the case, which are a little bit tight, so it's worth using a screwdriver on. And then a couple of extra screws at the top and bottom above where the previous mounting points were for the fan tray. Once you've done that, you can then take that out. And I would actually recommend removing this no matter what you're doing. If you can take that tray out, you'll have easier access to the cabling and also for plugging in cables on the motherboard. And I'll show you what I mean about that a bit later on. This tray at the front, you can see again, is held in place with a couple of thumb screws, one that mounts into the front and one that mounts into the bottom. And then you have the option to use the other one. So there's two different designs and what you use will vary depending on your preference for aesthetics but also the setup of the case and what you're installing so for example i found that in order to mount a radiator on the side on that rear panel you need to use this flatter one because that ensures that it's out of the way and doesn't get interfere with the radiator it's worth talking about radiators as well i mentioned that you could install two theoretically you can install a 360mm radiator on the top on the front or on that rear side panel where the motherboard tray is you can't install on the front and the rear panel at the same time, unfortunately, it's worth noting. So it's either front and top or side and top. And those are the combinations that you need to go for. But you can see again, the fan tray is removable here. So you can take the LO120s out, replace them if you want to, or just get easy access to them. They are all connected. Now the next stage is installing a power supply unit because I want to demonstrate a few things about that. I've done a video separately on the Corsair RM850X and this is another one of them and I'd recommend installing all your cables beforehand. So for this motherboard I've got two 8 pin CPU connections, multiple different SATA connections, so your SATA power connections and obviously the all important 24 pin motherboard connection that will go on the right hand side. I'm using Corsair's premium individually sleeved cables here these are PSU cables an extra purchase over and above the cables that come with the RM850X but they have a really nice aesthetic to them because they're individually sleeved and they come with cable combs and you can really neaten things up a lot so you can see this is the CPU connections for the two connections on the top of the motherboard and I'll show you where these things plug in a bit later on but we're connecting those up to the relevant points on the PSU and the reason to do this now is because it'd be a lot easier than plugging in and installing the PSU and then going about trying to put the cables in because you can't necessarily see into the case. But the other thing this demonstrates is the amount of room at the bottom of the case. So you can see I've still got the hard disk drive cage in there and you install the PSU with a fan facing downwards so that it can pull cold air in from the bottom. But what you'll see is with the size of the RM850X, it's not actually possible to install it like that. And so you end up having to move the hard disk drive caddy forwards towards the front of the case. That gives us more room in terms of mounting the RM850X, but also more room for cables because it means you can tuck more cabling down there. And that's very important because later on you'll see just how much cable there is to deal with 
and how that can become problematic if you're not managing those cables really well. So the process for installing it, as I said, make sure that it is facing downwards with that fan. That will then pull cold air in from the bottom and exhaust it through this rear here. You have four screws included to screw it into the case and hold it in place. One of the highlights of this case is the design of the various different cable channeling sections. So obviously you have these plastic housings that you can run cables through to, and you have various different loops for plastic cable ties. But what I really like to do early on is to use these Velcro ties that Corsair have kindly provided, and you can basically just hook them through the various cable channeling sections. And this is a great way just to keep those cables out of the way ensure they don't cause any problems and also just that they're neatly tucked away but without making a permanent fixture that you then need to cut with scissors or something for example so i've run the two eight pin power cables for the motherboard up to the top and then the 24 pin through to the front as i demonstrated there and i'll show you where those plug in in a bit now for the build process here, I'm going to remove the LL120s and all the cables, so obviously the RGB and power cables, and swap them out with the Corsair ML120 RGB Elites. But here you can see a look at the cables included in the extension leads. You'll notice as standard that they've actually marked the cables, labeled them up at 1, 2 and 3, and this is because they recommend installing your power cables and your RGB cables in order of the sequence that you want to go through the fans. Which is interesting because Corsa has recently updated the IQ software so that you can actually reposition the fans within the software. But I guess they're recommending this for the hardware level lighting controls that you install them in the correct order. So you need to work out the sort of sequence you want your RGB effects to go through. The LR120s obviously have two connections, power and RGB. And you can see they're very different looking. So on the right hand side here, the one with the two little clips on it and four pins is the power connection. The other one's the RGB connection. You can't get those the wrong way around on the Commander Core. And I'll show you once again later on how they plug in and reconnect. But for the purposes of this video, I'm using the ML120 RGB Elite. And they are perhaps not as nice looking in terms of the RGB lighting. And I'll show you some close-ups of them again in a second but they do offer better thermal performance and an interesting vortex design on the rear which potentially will offer a better cooling overall they also have some nice holographic style stickers on them so they're not too offensive depending on which way you're around and once again obviously you need those cables connect to the commander core and these are clearly marked one rgb and one power so what I'm doing here is essentially just removing the LR120s and putting them to the side and then I'm reinstalling the ML120 RGB Elite in the same setup with them facing towards the front of the case and this will then pull cold air in from the front and into the case obviously keeping things nice and cool but you'll see just the difference between the two if I get them side by side you can see that the LR120s have a lighting ring that runs around the outside of it and the, the fans light up as well. On the rear you have a horrible sticker on the back of the LR120s but it does have a cleaner look when it comes to the sort of hardware at the rear that keeps things stable. So it's really going to be a personal preference what you choose here. Obviously LR120s is more for the aesthetic purposes whereas the ML120 RGB Elites is more for cooling and superior cooling. I will say, however, that I do really like the LR120s. I've done some videos previously on them with, of course, their Crystal 680X and also the QL120s. But these new ML120 RGB Elites are designed to offer that superior cooling thanks to the Vortex design on them. They're also very nice looking. And the video isn't doing them justice because they seem to be spinning in a weird way here, but they don't look like that when they're running properly in the case, as you'll see a bit later on. So that was a close-up look at them. I'm going to do a separate video to compare them in a bit more depth. If you're curious, subscribe to see that if you're not already. And this process for installing these is fairly straightforward. Now what I'm going to do is, as you will see later on, use a lot of these fans. So I end up using nine of these and then one ML120 Pro, I believe because I didn't have a 10 of the elites, but I'm using those all set up and all plugged into the commander core and another commander core. So I end up with two at the end. But for this initial build, what I'm gonna do 
is use three of them here as intake on the front of the case and then three set up as exhaust through the 360 mil CPU cooler as well. So I'll just show you that process. But obviously this is fairly straightforward. One important point of note is to make sure that obviously the cables run in the same direction so you can put them facing through to the rear. And when you go to remount the bracket, you'll see there are some hooks on there and you can make sure that the cabling runs through to the back quite easily. One of the things you will notice as well is that with that cable hiding bracket on the side there on the rear panel, there's actually a number of different holes on it, which makes it really straightforward to run the cables through to the rear of the case and keep things looking nice and neat. And that is almost certainly one of the highlights of this case is it's really easy to build in there's lots of space and there's a lot of space for cables and to still maintain a really good design aesthetic in terms of the management of those cables. Don't end up particularly with loads of cables on display and the only mess is really at the back and obviously you can tidy that up and you might be better at cable management than me so that even then it might not be too bad but what you will see is that things will become a bit chaotic at the moment. So obviously we're running those back through to the back of the case and then plugging them into the Commander Core XT. I'd recommend doing this as soon as possible and also taking care once again to make sure you mount them in the correct order. So I'm starting from the bottom, for example, and calling that fan number one. And then the second one up at the front of the case is two. And then the top one is three. And then I'm gonna run the sequence across the top of the radiator. So the front of the radiator will be four and then five and six towards the back. And that will then hopefully give a very nice sort of RGB effect running across each of those. Obviously, it ends up being a bit messy at this stage, plugging these cables in, because I'm just running them all to the commander core. But it's important to do that now, because what you don't want to do, based on my previous experience, is put all your fans in, run all the cables to the back, and then not be sure which cable goes to which fan. So it makes it a lot easier to just plug them in as soon as you can. You can always unplug them one by one. And tidy them up. So just to show you the different options that you have, I'm using an NZXT Kraken Z73 here, which is one of my favorite 360 rads and CPU coolers because it has an LCD display on it. I'll also be using a Corsair H150i Elite Caplix later on, but I just wanted to show you that you do have the option. So for example, we have the option to install the ML120 RGB Elite fans here on this radiator. You don't have to use NZXT fans. We can use these Corsair fans on there. So you can still maintain that same fan aesthetic that we have on the front through to the radiator as well. So here I am mounting those fans facing downwards into the case, which is then pulling the air from inside the case out and exhausting it out the top. So using the long screws that are included with the radiator to mount those fans to the rad in this position. Another important point is obviously to make sure that your fan cabling is pointing towards the back of the case and that it's all set up so you'll be able to reach the CPU in a nice way because my end goal is to mount it on the top and reach through there. Now one of the things about this cooler is it has a three pin connection for power so you can see there's three different ports for power connected to the pump head. So instead of connecting these fans up to the commander core, I'm actually going to connect the power to those to the pump head. And then that allows the pump and the motherboard to control the speed of the fans on this radiator. But the RGB connections I'm going to run to the back and plug into the commander core. That means that I still have the RGB synced up and can control that within Corsair's IQ software. But the fan speed and the pump speed is all controlled by the motherboard and NZXT software. So you actually make sure that everything's running smoothly. This is one option for how to do it. I'm going to show you another one later on when I do it with the Corsair H150i. But that, that is how I would do it in this setup. And that still will work very nicely because of the power is being delivered properly. And then obviously we're mounting the radiator to the top using the small screws that are included with that system. And then you can either use this dust cover or not. That'll be your personal preference, as I discussed earlier on. And then reseat that lid. Once again, remember, don't try and pick up the case with this lid. It looks like it goes on hard and it's on there nice and tight, but it does pop off quite easily if you do try and lift it, trust me. So this is where we're at now. We have the 360mm radiator installed on the top and the three intake fans on the front and quite a mess of cables. But you can see those cables dangling down from the top of the radiator and I have enough space to run them back through there quite easily. So once I get them back through to the back, I can then connect the power up to the pump head, as I said, 
and the RGB light into the commander core, which I'll show you in a second. One of the things of note here is just how much space there is at the top. You can see there's plenty of room to get your hand up there. Obviously the motherboard's not installed yet, but even when it is, as I'll show you later on, it's dead simple to get everything run through. So now I have those cables running through to the back, just connecting up those RGB cables. Again, making sure to be careful to install those in the right sequence. So as I said, the front fan is going to be number four, and then five and six will follow that towards the back of the case. Next stage is set up the motherboard. I'm assuming that you know how to do RAM and CPU. If you don't, I have separate videos on those, but here we are installing the NZXT Z73 backplate bracket for this. This is an Intel 11th gen motherboard, so it's Z590, and I'm installing the standoff screws for that. Preparing everything before I put the motherboard in, it just makes things a bit less fiddly. So you have four standoff screws, that go in place. I've done a video separately on the Z73 if you want to see the installation process for that or if you're curious and want to find out more about it. And then I'm in putting on some thermal paste which people will say I've done wrong because people always love to comment on that. And then we're going about the build process putting the motherboard in. One of the things you'll note is there's some markings on the case about the size of the motherboard. So an ATX motherboard all the standoff screws are already included for that but you do have multiple different points for mounting, for example, ITX or EATX motherboards. You'll then see those screws in my hand are the right ones that you want to use for mounting your motherboard in. You should find about nine different mounting points in there, so we just need to make sure that it's slotted in so you can see all the different holes there and that the motherboard is poking through at the back and you have an IO shield installed if you have one. This motherboard has it integrated in there already, so it's already installed at the rear and then just screwing it down and making sure it's in place. Once again you can see loads of potential access here to the top especially so for plugging in something like the 8 pin power connectors to the motherboard at the top can usually be quite fiddly but it's actually really easy here. Next stage is just to mount the CPU pump head and the cooler to make sure that's in place and it isn't going to fly about when they're moving the case around. So we just need to seat that down on top of the CPU and then put the four thumb screws down and carefully screw them on without applying too much tension or pressure to these points because obviously we don't want to damage the pins or the CPU or anything else. You will note there is some pressure unfortunately against the RAM with this CPU cooler because the pump is quite big and the tubes push up against the RAM but it is possible to install it. I've done this in multiple setups now. It's just a very tight fit and quite a scary one, but the end result is very nice looking as you will see. Now, as I said, you have multiple cables here. We have a SATA power connection. You have USB connection that needs to plug into the bottom of the motherboard. And then we have the various different power connections for the fans, which I'm gonna to run to the rear and then I'm gonna connect up those. So the SATA power connection will go to the PSU, USB runs out to the back of the case, then down to the bottom and plugs into the USB port, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we have another cable which goes to the CPU fan header or AIO pump, depending on which one you have or want to use. AIO pump may be the most logical because that is what it is after all. As I said, with the way I'm setting it up, the motherboard and the NZXT software will have control of the fan speed and the pump speed to ensure the best cooling for this setup here. So now I run all those cables to the back. The next stage is to plug in the motherboard power connections. So the two 8-pin PSU cables here and plugging into the top, you may find slightly different position depending on the motherboard. But for me, there's those two which connect up here. And on some other ones, you might find this one at the bottom or the side. And you also have the more important 28 pin power connection, which I'll show you in a minute. Then there's the front panel connections that go on the top. So this, these fat ones are for your USB. So this is the USB A connections. There are two of them because you have four connections on top. You also have the USB C. You need to run them through roughly in the middle and you'll find that they connect up here. So the USB-C, for example, plugs in just below the 24 pin power supply connection on the motherboard on the right hand side. And then you have the two USB connections. Now this motherboard does have ports that you can connect up to. You can see I've done one there and I'm about to do the bottom one. But you can actually purchase splitters, so if you don't have two, it is possible to get hardware that will allow you to connect up 
two by then splitting them into one connection, connecting that up. So it's worth checking out if you can't do it, that you can find alternative accessories in order to do this. The next stage is to connect up the 24 pin. And here is where I come unstuck. So I want you to not do what I'm doing, which is trying to connect the 24 pin power connection to the motherboard from behind the cable hiding tray. There is not much room there, it was very tight. I had to unscrew it in various places in order to do this. But the reason I didn't take it off completely is I still had a lot of cabling and I'd reseated the fan bracket if I remember correctly. So it was a real fiddle and I was trying to get around it in a roundabout way. It was very tight. It is possible to do, but it's also very tight and very fiddly. So now I'm connecting up the power for those three fans on the radiator directly to the NZXT pump head because it has those three power connections there. You can, if you prefer, connect those power to the commander core if you'd rather do it that way. But this does give you another option because it means that you could install an exhaust fan and potentially use the commander core for that. As a reference, obviously, I'm showing you the different options. Now, some of the cables where I'm confident I'm not going to be moving them, for example, the two eight pins power connections for the CPU, I can use the plastic ties to tie that down. You can see there's one at the bottom here, which will just neaten things up and make life a bit easier. The USB connection for the commander core that runs through to the front of the case. As I said, you do have a male pin, so you can potentially plug something else into that and then plug the single USB connection. It's kind of like a Y splitter. I actually found this didn't work very well for me though, and I did end up using the two USB ports on the bottom of the motherboard instead. But you might not have that problem. USB front panel audio connection usually connects in the bottom left. This is for your 3.5mm jack on top of the case and that will plug in on your motherboard usually at the bottom left but you can refer to the motherboard manual to work out exactly where that's placed. And then obviously the USB connection. This is for the commander core and for the NZXT AIO so those both plug in at the bottom roughly in the middle. You can't really get these wrong because the way the pins are set up you can't plug them in the wrong way around so those just connect up there. And then the power connections usually go on the right hand side. Again reference your motherboard manual to find out where they are and also what order they plug into but basically that allows the buttons to work on the top front of the case so you can press and turn on the power. Now I'm installing an RTX 3090 gigabyte card that is my own personal GPU I'll be using in this build for testing purposes but also just to demonstrate just how much space you've got. So the 3090 is a pretty chunky card. This is a two slot card but it's quite a long one and you can see the installation options that you have here. Now as I mentioned earlier on there's also a vertical mounting bracket much like there was in the 5000D airflow. So you unscrew a bit at the top there and then you get a couple more screws that you need to have access to and then you can remove the plate and pull those out and then you put the GPU in there. You will need a PCI extender cable to run that then from there to the motherboard. I'm not doing it in this instance because my previous tests show that if you have an air setup and you're not liquid cooling your CPU this is a terrible idea and I wouldn't recommend it. It looks really good but unless you're going to run your case with the door open constantly this is going to throttle your GPU because it just runs too hot. Now with a setup like this I found that there's enough space to run your power supply cables for the GPU round underneath the cable harding tray and then up and I think this looked pretty good at the end actually because it gives you a, a bit of flexibility in terms of where you're running those cables from. You could potentially run them from somewhere else but this is what I ended up doing and you'll see the other options a bit later and again these are Corsair's premium cables and because they have multiple cones on them they're individually sleeved you can end up making things look quite nice. Also with this bracket in place you can hide things away but it's going to vary depending on the setup you're using how it's hidden and what it looks like but you can see it looks reasonable at the moment obviously I'm going to tidy that up a little bit. Now SSDs I showed how they can be mounted at the rear of the case but you can also mount them on the front so instead of mounting at the rear if you want to save space or if you just want to show off your SSDs or if you want to be able to see them you can put them here. Obviously there's two points for doing that and you can connect them up there and then run the power cables and the data cables through the holes just behind them and into the back of the case so you can potentially save cabling at the back or just show off for a slightly different design 
And here you have the end result of this basic setup. So with all the parts off, you can see the RGB lighting strips on the top and the front and the bottom and what that looks like. And also the reflections of the RGB fans onto the surroundings. So it's pretty nice. One thing I did want to demonstrate though, and this obviously isn't perfect because of the way I run the cables. For example, the GPU cable is going through that fan tray, which isn't ideal. But I did find that it isn't terribly easy to close the door, even with so few fans. It was just popping out the bottom. This isn't a problem I had with the 5000 D airflow, so I was surprised to see it with the T. But something to bear in mind that you do need to manage your cables really well because it is a bit unforgiving, that door. And I did find that a bit later on with other setups as well. But here you can see the final result. I'm actually pretty pleased with it. Bear with me in a minute because I'm going to show you obviously changing it out and adding in even more fans and the potential setup for that. But this is what it looks like with those MR120s and the Kraken Z73 and obviously my lovely shiny GPU. And the highlights for this case are obviously that you have the LR120s as standard, you have the Commander Core and also those RGB lighting strips. And within Corsair's IQ software, as I'll show you in a second, you can also customize that lighting and link it together and either have sequences of lighting or have it all doing the same color and other things. But the important thing here is obviously to test the performance of this. I only have six fans in here and it's quite a large case. So I ran it through Cinebench R23. Now this is a Core i9-11900K which isn't known for running particularly fast versus the 12 series CPU and even the 10th series, but under heavy load with this is getting 84 degrees C maximum out of it, which isn't too bad actually, really. the These Intel CPUs, i9s are known for running quite warm and I found like this performance was pretty good. But an important point of note is that even when doing this, the case was actually very quiet you do have some options in terms of ramping up the fans. I ran it with Blender as well. So again, put the CPU under load. Both Cinebench and Blender obviously put it under a heavier load than you would gaming. But you can see 93 degrees was the max temperature I got there. And that is fairly toasty, but it's still well below that 100 degrees that would end up horribly throttling it. So it's definitely a good setup. But more importantly, under normal use, with gaming and just browsing and things like that. It's relatively quiet. I was surprised how quiet it is and even when you put more in. So I ran it also with Heaven Benchmark and you can see the results of the temperatures here. We've got 85 degrees on the hottest spot of the GPU. So now the next step of the process is to end up changing things and swapping them out. So you're adding in a lot more fans just to be able to demonstrate how to do this. So obviously I have taken out the NZXT Kraken Z73 and now I'm going to mount fans in its place instead. I'm going to top mount exhaust fans, so I'm using the ML120 RGB Elites again. Same logic, I'm running the fan cables to the rear and then I'm just going to install those three fans on the top to exhaust air out. So where there's going to be hot air coming up from the GPU and other things, it's just going to get exhausted out the top. And obviously this is just one option in how you set it up. You may choose to keep this here and just side mount some fans instead of intake and then put one at the rear as exhaust or you can exhaust out the top as I am. I just want to be able to demonstrate all the different potential options that you have. Obviously there's also enough space in here for a full liquid cooling system if you so choose. For the rear, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately I don't have enough RGB elites, but I do have an ML120 still that I can use. So it's not going to look quite the same, but it still does work in this setup. I'm using that again to exhaust. So I've got six intake fans and four exhaust fans in this setup. So it's 10 fans in total. And I was surprised actually, as you will see later on, the, the levels of sound didn't get a lot higher, but it did get a little bit cooler, which is nice. Now I've removed that back tray, obviously the cable hiding tray and also the fan tray. And I am now going about the process of installing the radiator on it. So this is Corsair's 360mm radiator, the H150i Elite Capelix, which I've done a video on previously with the LCD display on it. And I am mounting it to ensure that the tubes are at the top, but the pump isn't the highest point in the build process. Important point of note, because people will criticize and say that you should have the tubes at the bottom. 
actually it's just as long as the pump isn't the highest point again making sure that the cables are running through so you can see on this fan bracket there are a number of holes where you can run your cables through to the back and hide them away this obviously allows us to run them back to the commander core and also just to keep things neat the important point is also the setup of the fans you'll notice that i've got them set to intake this time so i'm intaking cold air in from the front and from the radiator so the logic here being that if i was pulling cold air in through the front and then exhausting it immediately through the side i thought this would be counterproductive and would negatively impact the temperatures in the case overall so although yes i'm pulling cold air in and running it over the radiator potentially warming it up and then pulling it into the case i am also pulling cold air in from the front so the two should then cool each other down and you end up with cold air running over the gpu and then exhausting out the top through those top exhaust fans and the rear as well this in my opinion is a logical setup although i haven't tested both layouts because frankly I didn't have the time to set it up in three different ways. But here you can see just the process for reinstalling the fan tray, which is slightly problematic because you do need to get the pins for both sides through. And I also found that while I was doing this, that the hard disk drive tray is now in the way. So essentially what I've established is if you're side mounting or rear mounting, a 360 mil radiator you sadly just cannot use the hard disk drive tray i found there's not enough room with my psu and with the bracket as well so you need to stick to ssds or nvme drives at least that's what i found perhaps if your cable management is nicer you might be able to manage it but this is one of the foibles obviously the option would be potentially intake with just fans there instead and use the front for your radiator mounting or stick to the top but i think it's worth covering off the small points that hopefully other people might not have picked up on and you should find useful then we need to go about the process of reinstalling all the different screws so three down this side and then three on the other side underneath where the cables are normally hidden now the h150i elite capolux comes with its own commander core and this is necessary because obviously the xt only supports six fans and this one only supports six fans so there's no way of plugging in all 10 fans uh, you do have options obviously you could use your rgb lighting nodes that you'd get with the fans and then you could use your motherboard power connectors for fans as well so it is a potential option if you don't have this control box if you're using a different radiator for example that is another option so what i'm doing here is obviously i've bundled up my cables from the top of the case i installed those three exhaust cables and i'm now going to connect those up again connecting them up in sequence so now things get a bit more complicated because the sequence is what are you going to do you can have the three fans at the front of the case one two three and then where are you going to run the next ones across the top and then down the radiator so you need to work out what sort of sequence you're going to do that in and then we have the final setup so obviously this is all the steps of that you need to connect up both commander cores the usb connection both have to have sata power connections and you also obviously need to plug the pump head in cpu connection same as i did with the kraken z73 and the end result is now that three fans on the front is intake three fans on the radiator is intake and then also exhausting out the top and the rear as well and I've plugged in the fans that are on the top and the one at the rear and connected those up to the commander core. And obviously everything's connected up in two different ways. So one commander core has six fans on it, the other one has four fans on it. And then we then go about the process of going into Windows and testing things. So obviously I want to run the similar benchmarks again. So Cinebench R23 on its second run. And this time round, I found that the temperatures are a bit better. So you can see we have a maximum of about 64 degrees. So it actually ran quite a bit cooler, which was surprising. Although obviously there are a lot more fans going on here. This isn't a slight against NZXT's Kraken. It is just the difference in the number of fans included in the case now. We have a lot more intake fans in there. And I think this shows that it's a good setup for that design and for this logic and also i was surprised that it didn't run a lot louder it runs cooler but not necessarily a lot louder 
So now in Corsair's IQ software demonstrating some of the things that you can do with it. So you can see that you have some default settings for the RGB lighting effects on the left hand side. And as I go through them, you'll see that they go through in sequence across not only the fans, but also the light strips in the case as well. You can also choose from solid colors. So Corsair's blue and yellow, different colors there, or a static red color and other things. You'll note that both the Commander Core and the case itself are listed separately. So for the CPU cooler and for the case, and you can go through the hardware lighting setup to set up these fans and register what they are, depending on what fans you plugged in. And then you can go about the process of choosing your different lighting ones. So you'll see that you have a different lighting setup at the top and also custom options, but lighting link is the most logical one to use because that will ensure that not only the fans on the radiator, but also the ones on the case, even though they're on different commanders, will work well with each other. So you have various different effects that you can go through. Rain, spiral rainbow, rainbow wave, color shift, color wave, visor. You can set it up with a static color because that will ensure that not only is the RGB lighting on the fans that are connected to both commander cores synced up so that all the fans match up, but also that the RGB lighting strips that are included with the case will also follow the same sequence resulting in some very nice lighting effects, whether you're choosing to use the various different ones in a sequence of effects, for example, the color pulse or color wave or visor, or simply a static color, so something like blue throughout the case or a green or whatever you prefer, really. And the RGB lighting on these Corsair fans and in the case in general is pretty fantastic, as you've seen from the clips. Another thing to bear in mind is that you can also go into the hardware lighting section on this setting and on the other commander core for the pump and you can set for hardware lighting, which will then ensure that when Corsair IQ is not running, that you can set up the colors for that and have specific colors set. You might choose to dim it, for example. So if you've locked your PC and gone away from it, or if you're just not running IQ, it'll default the, to this RGB lighting, and that's also what it will be when it boots up. So you might want to check up on that. Now, the next thing that I did is to also dive into the fan speed. So you can see under the cooling section for the case, you can go in and you can select the fans and the speed that they're running at. And you have the option to choose from quiet, zero RPM, balance and extreme modes. And I wanted to check and see what the difference is between those are. Obviously, zero RPM has the benefit that the fans simply won't spin unless they're required. So if the CPU and GPU are at a good temperature, the fans won't spin. And you'll see them during basic use for browsing the web, and for example just ramping right down and stopping spinning altogether. Some of them will spin or some won't, or they just all won't spin at all. Admittedly, you'll find that they often do spin up a little bit, but even when you put them onto extreme, I found that it was still pretty quiet. As you can see, I've got a decibel meter here, and it was registering somewhere between 54 and 56 decibels in a quiet room. Now, obviously this is with the door off, and your experience may vary depending on the environmental temperatures of the surrounding area and also the fan setup that you have and other things. But I, I found that I was pleasantly surprised by how quiet it is even when you ramp the fans up. Now you can go into the pump and obviously adjust the fan speed on there as well, and the pump speed and go into all those settings. But I played around with each of them. Obviously you probably generally want to stick to quiet or balanced mode uh, rather than extreme constantly all the time, but you obviously have the option to adjust these things and also create custom fan presets as well within Corsair's IQ software. So there's plenty of stuff to play around with there, but I was just pleasantly surprised by how quiet it is. You can also obviously go in and adjust things like the RGB lighting strips individually and set those up the way you want them. But I personally found that using lighting link to connect everything up was the best way to do it and there's plenty of things to dabble around with within Corsair's and IQ software to set this up in a variety of different ways with various satisfying lighting effects. So hopefully you found this video useful. I've gone into a lot of depth on all the different things related to this case and everything that you can do with it. If you've made it this far in the video, please like and subscribe and let me know in the comments what you think. I'd also like to thank you for watching and give a special thanks to my YouTube members who pay a small amount of money each month to support the channel. If you'd like to find out more about the benefits of being a member, please click that join button. Thanks for watching. 
This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.